how many pharmaceutical drugs exist in the United States today and what percent of them do you feel there is accurate information on the benefits and risks that it would be appropriate to recommend them to someone? Uh, the German health technology assessment folks looked at this issue and they determined that of the new molecular entities that are approved each year, so this is not the Me Too drugs, the, uh, it's not the drugs that are long acting or combined or uh, in some way of reformulation, the 30 or so new molecular entities that the FDA approves each year, one out of four of them has been shown to be significantly superior to previously available therapy. And the problem, as I was just saying, is that we don't have health technology assessment in the United States, so the doctors can't know which one of the four is the one that really will improve uh, their patient's care. And it it's, turns into a marketing free-for-all, and it's just which companies can market most effectively that determines their sales. I, I completely agree with that. The bo bottom line is when you're uh, instituting a new therapy or assessing a new therapy, you don't compare it against placebo. You have to compare it against placebo and any previous therapy to be able to determine whether or not there's an improvement in efficacy. And when you do the statistics, you have to compare the new drug against the old drug as well as against the placebo. And you then have to look at number needed to treat to determine whether or not there's actually a value to, uh, you know, to the medical profession and to mankind in terms of using it, that enough people are actually helped by it, that it actually is worth the cost. These are things that are never discussed. Yeah, and let me jump in and, and then I'll back off. Um, if you look at the FDA approved label for Humira, which until the COVID vaccines came out was the largest selling, biggest selling drug in the United States and the world. In the FDA approved label of Humira, which belongs to the manufacturer, not to the FDA, it does show one trial that compared Humira as a single drug to methotrexate as a single drug to do that study, uh, Dr. Lustig, that you were just describing. And what it shows is that Humira, which costs about $480 a year, is equally effective to, hum excuse me, methotrexate that costs $480 a year is equally as effective as, as Humira, which costs $72,000 a year. I really liked uh, Dr. Abramson's characterization that to do science, what you need is a subpoena these days. I mean, that's, that's a sound bite. And but what we're dancing around, we, we can talk about we can split hairs about the research types and the different things you have to do to get proper science. But the thing we're dancing around is that according to their criminal settlements with U.S. federal prosecutors, big pharma is the most criminal industry in history. They've lost 86 billion in judgments and settlements to civil and U.S. federal prosecutors since 2000, and they have thousands of criminal criminal records. So most of the studies we're talking about are not surgical studies. Everybody knows those are there's hardly any decent surgical sham surgery studies, as um, the other gentleman alluded to, with with a possible exception of a few things like uh, endoscopic knee surgery, where we do have good sham surgery studies that show it doesn't work at all. Uh, but uh, the, for the drugs, we have to assume that the, the, the way the study is set up and the conclusions and the way they hide the data completely adulterates the results. So, you, 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 you know, Dr. Abramson is quite Mandarin about the way he phrased it, but he understands this, this uh, uh, subject and this comprehensively. And I, I like the soundbite. Thank you. Isn't there a difference between because I think what you're referring to when you say you need a subpoena is you're referring to industry sponsored trials. They're all industry um, sponsored. How much research out there in the pharmaceutical industry is independent, is not industry funded? So 86% of uh, clinical trials about drugs are industry funded. And are the 14% are the that are not more reliable? I mean, can we look to them? Uh, that's a good question, but um, the 97% uh, of the most frequently cited studies of drugs are commercially funded. So 
uh, that is what is dominating the knowledge ether uh, about what yeah. people think they what docs think they know about the drugs. Let me uh, let me throw something in. Also, We're bringing it back to something Dr. Abrams, uh, I think it was Dr. Abramson said earlier about um, meta analyses. People use meta analyses to try to get at this. Well, the fact is, meta analyses are conglomerations of multiple different studies to try to get to one single answer, and often those uh, studies have different um, uh, procedures and uh, different. Uh, uh, out, outcome uh, variables that they look at. And the way I look at meta-analyses is garbage in, garbage out. Let me give you an example of garbage in, garbage out. Um, it's not related to drugs, it's related to food, but you will get the idea. Um, a meta-analysis was published uh, back in 2015 by my nemesis, who will remain nameless for the moment, um, looking at the question of sugar sweetened beverages and weight gain and diabetes, okay, obesity and diabetes. And the result of that uh, uh, meta-analysis was inconclusive, inconclusive uh, uh, effects of sugar sweetened beverage consumption on obesity and diabetes. My colleague here at UCSF, Dean Schillinger, looked at that study and said, I, I see what's wrong here. And what he did was he redid the study since this, all the papers were mentioned in, you know, in the, in the, uh, in the uh, reference section. He pulled all those papers and he redid the meta-analysis and he added one variable, industry sponsorship. It turned out of the 60 studies in that meta-analysis, 26 of them were funded by uh, industry. And of all of those 26, all 26 said no effect of sugar beverages on diabetes or obesity. Of the 34 studies that were independently funded, 33 of them showed a significant relationship between uh, sugar beverages and diabetes and obesity. In other words, the industry had polluted the literature very specifically so that they could then do a meta-analysis and say, see no effect, because inconclusive, because they basically dropped, you know, they basically, you know, peed on the peed on the medical literature. So, um, you know, doing it right is essential, and having the data is essential. And yes, industry-sponsored studies are industry-sponsored because they are looking for a specific answer. They, are, they do not have the null hypothesis in mind when they do the study. Let me clarify. Um, did you, Dr. Abramson, say that 97% of the most frequently cited studies are funded by industry? Is that what you said? Yes. And do, what does that mean in terms of if, I go, if someone goes to the doctor, if 97% of the most frequently cited studies are funded by industry, what percentage of pharmaceutical drugs that are prescribed should I assume are more beneficial for me than not taking. In other words, not forget about comparing it, you know, even if it's an older variety, instead of comparing it to an older variety, just should, whether I take it or not, what percent am I taking something that's actually detri more detrimental than if I didn't take it? The answer is definitely, you can't know. I, I gave a lecture at Harvard with Jerry Avorn, who uh, wrote one of the first wave of books that came out when uh, my first book came out. And he said he tells his residents, when a new drug comes out, don't prescribe it for your patients for a year until it's been out for a year. But if the patients in your family wait five years. <laughs> That's great. Okay. Um, yeah, the consensus seems to be about half. That's that's a simple answer. Half half the drugs either don't work or are actually harmful, and that's that's in several articles uh, say that figure. Here's here's another quote that I I like to uh, say. Harry Lloyd, who was a Park Davis pharmaceutical CEO, he said if we put horse manure in a capsule, we could sell it to ninety five percent of these doctors, and that's their attitude towards us, the patients and the doctors. There's no question about that. I mean, the when uh, AstraZeneca was losing its patent on Prilosec and came up with um, um, 
uh, what's the P proton pump inhibitor that starts with a Z? I'll think of it in a second. Zantac. No, no. Not no, Zantac? No, Zantac was, is a previous generation. Oh, oh um, right. you're, you're right, you're right. Um, uh, we'll, we'll get it, it doesn't matter. But the AstraZeneca came up with this solution, Nexium is the drug. Uh, oh, AstraZeneca came up with this uh, solution that was Nexium, and Nexium is actually just one of the two halves of the organic molecule that makes Prilosec, and it's clearly no better. It, it's a little bit stronger because it's metabolized more slowly, but you can adjust the dose. But the point that I want to make is that AstraZeneca had a patent on uh, Nexium, and therefore they could put as much money as they wanted into marketing that drug. And I didn't write it in the book. Um, I, I think Dr. Yoho said maybe I'm uh, I, maybe I'm reined in a little bit because I still have an academic appointment. But I, I, that's what I would have written in the book: is you could put dog shit in the capsule, and as long as you have a monopoly on that, so that you can invest as much money as you want to market it, you're going to be able to sell it. By the way, I mean, just for the audience, in case they don't know, um, all those proton pump inhibitors are now associated with um, Alzheimer's disease.